In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged them. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz to bring some of the people of Israel to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. Among them were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. The king was angry and furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. Nebuchadnezzar, in a furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought to him. If you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you out of my hands? And Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank, and God gave Daniel favor and compassion. Be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Daniel blessed the God of heaven and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. Truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings. Tremble in fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. Okay, good morning again. Uh, my name is Brad. If you don't know me, I'm the campus pastor here, and I'm also on the preaching team, and, and we're glad you're here. Um, whether you came here for a child dedication, or this is your church home, or you just wandered in here, we're, we're glad you're here. Uh, we will be in the book of Daniel this morning, and so I would ask that you turn there. And we, we have quite a bit to do this morning, but the good news is that the Lord will help us. Um, and so we're going to be finishing the book of Daniel today. Uh, we're going to go through chapter 11 and 12, so chapters 11 and 12 this morning. And this is a book about God working through and, and around a guy named Daniel who is a faithful exile. That's why we call this series Faithful Exile. Um, Daniel is a guy who's not home. He and the, the people of God have been taken captive. They're away from their homeland and and so they're, they're representing God, they're representing the kingdom of God in a foreign place. And so we've been watching God move mightily through Daniel, and um, this is the, the book, if you grew up in church, with the fiery furnace and the lion's den, and um, God is just delivering his people through crazy circumstances to show that he has a plan for them, um, that as the, the, the scripture says, that he does have a plan and a future um, not only for our little ones, but also for us as, as his people. Um, and so in chapter 10, this divine figure shows up to talk to Daniel. And he is clothed in white, and his face shines like the sun. And if you look at your Bible and look back to Revelation, um, people argue about who this divine figure is. But to me, I'm fully resolved in my mind that it is the pre-incarnate Christ that Jesus is talking to Daniel prophetically, letting him know what is going to happen. And so the Messiah is talking to Daniel. The Messiah has strengthened Daniel. Daniel, as he's talking to him, is so weak that he faints. And, and this divine figure, which again, I, I believe is Jesus, is picking him up and strengthening him so that he can hear this prophecy, so that he can hear what is going to happen. And so in chapters 11 and 12, we're going to see some, some forward-looking prophecy about political turmoil, about kingdoms rising and falling. And then in chapter 12, there's this moment of encouragement, but also of, of personal reckoning. A moment of reflection of, of what does your future look like? Do you have reason to be optimistic? Do you have reason to have hope? So this morning, C.S. Lewis would say we've never met a, a mere mortal, that everyone that we know, everyone that we meet or, or, or work with or sit with in church has an eternal future, a destination. So as I was studying this, I just had this, just a picture of a, of a ship headed toward a certain destination. And so you have a destination, I have a destination, and the question for us is who or what are you trusting for your future? What is guiding your future? Who is guiding your future? How do you know that the future is bright, or is it? And so I believe this, this text will, will point us there and, and will give us some encouragement. And if, if you're not in Christ, I hope it, it bears on you to, to surrender to his lordship and to allow him to pilot 
you. So we're going to have a lot to read, and I just want to ask um, that, that you would give reverent attention to, to God's word. If you're here and you're not a believer, if you would suspend your disbelief and read this as if it were true, if you are a believer, just know this is the word of God. And so chapter 11 has a lot of words in it. I'll explain briefly what they mean, and then we'll go into chapter 12. So let's read this together. Daniel chapter 11. As for me, in the first year of Darius the Mede, I stood up to confirm and strengthen him. And now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. And when he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. And as soon as he has risen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, that means his offspring, his, his, his children, his relatives, not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled, for his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. Then the king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he and shall rule, and his authority shall be a great authority. After some years they shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure. And she shall be given up, and her attendants, he who fathered her, and he who supported her in these times. Verse 7. And from a branch from her roots, one shall arise in his place. He shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north, and he shall deal with them and shall prevail. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold. For some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. Then the latter shall come into the realm of the king of the south, but shall return to his own land. His sons shall wage war and assemble a multitude of forces, which shall keep coming and overflow and pass through, and again shall carry the war as far as his fortress." Then the king of the south, moved with rage, shall come out and fight against the king of the north. And he shall raise a great multitude, but it shall be given into his hand. And when the multitude is taken away, his heart shall be exalted, and he shall be cast down, and he shall cast down tens of thousands, but he shall not prevail. For the king of the north shall again raise a multitude greater than the first. And after some years, he shall come on with a great army and abundant supplies. In those times, many shall arise against the king of the south. And the violent among your own people shall lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. Then the king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and make a well-fortified city. And the forces of the south shall not stand or even his best troops, for there shall be no strength to stand. But he who comes against him shall do as he wills, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his hand. He shall set his face to come with the strength of his whole kingdom, and he shall bring terms of an agreement and perform them. He shall give him the daughter of women to destroy the kingdom, but it shall not stand or to be to his advantage. Afterward, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall capture Many of them, but a commander shall put an end to his insolence. Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back upon him. Then he shall turn his face back toward the fortress of his own land, but he shall stumble and fall and shall not be found. Then shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle." In his place shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. And from the time that an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, and he shall become strong with a small people. 
Without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province, and he shall do what neither his fathers nor his father's fathers have done, scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods. He shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time. And he shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south with a great army. And the king of the south shall wage war with an exceedingly great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for plots shall be devised against him. Even those who eat his food shall break him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. And as for the two kings, their hearts shall be bent on doing evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail, for the end is yet to be at the time appointed. Verse 28, and he shall return to his land with great wealth, but his heart shall be set against the holy covenant, and he shall work his will and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come into the south, but it shall not be, it shall not be this time as it was before, for the ships of Kittim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the holy covenant. He will turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the holy covenant. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, and many shall join themselves to them with flattery. And some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end for it still awaits the point of time. And the king shall do as he wills. He shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers nor to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the God of fortresses instead of these, a God whom his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign God. Those who acknowledge him, he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price." The time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. And he shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become a ruler of the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. This is the word of God. When you're reading things in your Bible like this, like a genealogy or, or, or a chron chronological account, just know that, that the word of God is inspired, authoritative, and important. And so you might go, I have no idea what you just read, and that's okay, I'll summarize some of it but it's always profitable, even when we don't understand how. So I just want to just say that. Um, so Jesus is still talking here, this divine figure who's talking to Daniel, and, and the, the, the people of God are about to be restored from exile. They think this is going to be better for us. We're finally going to be free from Babylon. We're going to go to our homeland. And now there's all of this prophecy about all of this conflict, about sword and, and flame. And so they're like, man, this is not what I 
expected, but, but what follows in that prophecy that you just heard is a stunningly clear account of exactly what history records happened. And so it is meant to, to actually give confidence to God's people, not to scare them, even though they're going to go through great trouble, great tribulation. And so we have a resource for you if, if you want that. You can email me, brad at the doorchurch.net. I can give you this, uh, this rundown of all of these prophecies fulfilled in history, um, it, if, if you're so inclined. So just let me know if you, if you want to hear that. But I'll just say this. So one example here. So these kingdoms that are coming. So we know that the Persians come in, they take over. And then the Greeks come in and they take over. And then the Seleucids come in and they take over. And the Ptolemies come in and they take over. And so God's people are, are moved around in all of this conflict and turmoil. And so in verses 3 and 4 of chapter 11, a mighty king shall arise who's going to rule with great dominion. He's going to do as he wills. We know that that is Alexander the Great. He came through and he conquered. And then it says, the reason I pointed out the posterity thing in verse 4, that his kingdom will be broken and divided. Well, it was. He died in 323 BC. And what was normal is it would have gone to his posterity. It did not. It went to four generals. And so this just goes on, and the detail here goes on and on, and we don't have time for all of it. But, but what we do see in verses 33 through 35, there's this, this, this instruction about the wise during this trouble, which is both immediately relevant and also ultimately relevant as you think about the end times. He's saying the wise will... will Make many understand. The wise will encourage one another. The saints will encourage one another to remain faithful as exiles. Stand firm. God is moving. The future is bright, even though it might be ulti- or immediately uncertain. And so the wise are helping to encourage. And then there's this, this verse 36, verse 37, there's this antichrist. But we know how that goes. We know how that goes because we know the beginning. And the end, because we have the word of God. And so in Genesis 3, this will be on the screen. This was right after the fall of man. This is the proto-evangelion, the first gospel. God tells rebellious Adam, I'll put enmity between you and the woman. There's going to be trouble between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. In other words, there will be an opposer, an enemy, his name is Satan. Ultimately, though he will strike at us, his head shall be crushed. He shall be conquered. He shall, verse 45, come to his end with none to help him. So if you ever look at the world and you're like, does good win or evil win? Good wins in the end. So history is God's story. And he's moving through evil kings and empires and all of this for the redemption of his people. And so we can have trust and confidence in his grand plan. This was relevant for them and it is relevant for us. So that is what chapter 11 is ultimately about. So let's read chapter 12. It's not quite as long. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince, by the way, this lowercase p prince is is an angel, who has charge of your people. There shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above. And those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall increase. Then I, Daniel, looked and behold, two others stood, one on this bank of the stream and one on that bank of the stream. And someone said to the man clothed in linen, picture Jesus, this man clothed in linen, there's two angels on his side. 
Someone said to the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream, how long shall it be till the end of these wonders? Aren't we always asking that question? When will this happen? And I heard the man clothed in linen who was above the waters of the stream. He raised his right hand and his left hand toward heaven and swore by him who lives forever that it would be for a time, times, and half a time. And that when the shattering of the power of the holy people comes to an end, all these things would be finished. I heard, but I did not understand. You're not alone. I heard, but I did not understand. Then I said, oh my, oh Lord, what shall be the outcome of these things? So he's like, when are these things happening? What is the outcome? He said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. Many shall purify themselves and make themselves white and refined, but the wicked shall act wickedly. And none of the wicked shall understand, but those who are wise shall understand. And from the time that the regular burnt offering is taken away and the, abom the abomination that makes desolate is set up, there shall be 1,290 days. Blessed is he who waits and arrives at the 1,335 days. But go your way till the end, and you shall rest, and you shall stand in your allotted place at the end of days. So now Jesus begins to explain the time of the end. What it's going to be like. So there's three things that we see here. There's trouble, there's deliverance, and there's resurrection. And so there's trouble. There's tribulation. Unprecedented trouble. Serious trouble. And so if you're one of those people that, that thinks that you're just zapped up and there's no trouble, that God's people don't endure anything, well, th this seems to suggest there's going to be unprecedented trouble. Like natural disasters are nothing. World wars, nothing. There will be trouble, but we will, we will be, when I say we, God's people will be delivered. God will see his people through this trouble. Now, this is not a universal promise for all of mankind. It is not that, that he will see everyone through. He will see his people through. How do you know if you're one of his people? Your name is written in the book. It's sealed up. You, you are in there. You are one of the elect, one of the chosen ones. And then there's this resurrection that some will rise. Well, it says many of those who sleep in the dust shall awake some to everlasting life and, and, and to shame, some to shame and everlasting contempt. So resurrection sounds good, and it is. It's either really good or really bad. So we are raised to our reward. And, and by the way, when that happens, it's not a live trial. So you don't stand before God and he's like, man, let me, let me go back through this again. Why don't you argue your case? What did you do good and what did you do bad? It's, the ink is dry. And so if you are in the book, you are in the book. And so some will shine and some will be ashamed. Some will be risen to, to, to glow with the glory of God and, and some will be raised to, to everlasting contempt. And so when you hear shame and everlasting contempt, don't hear unfair judgment. Hear inescapable justice. God is good. He's a perfect judge. He never, ever gets it wrong. So it is perfect justice. And so you, you may be one of those people and you have a sin that you're, you're just thinking, I'll just take this to my grave. You've heard that saying, I, I'll just take it to my grave. No one's going to know. I'll just take it to my grave. Well, well, yes, you will, and no, you won't. Because there is an accounting given. And at this time of resurrection, we will have accountability. And, and so in this, this feeling of shame, it's the actual emotion of being exposed in your sin like a searchlight, being found out. This is, I'm convinced, why we have these dreams where we're walking through the hallways of our school and we don't have clothes on or, you know what I mean, you show up to work and you forgot your, your pants or something. Like, I think we have this fear of being exposed 
of being seen in our nakedness, and I would say even in our vileness, because there's parts of our souls that are ugly. And contempt is, is really, that's the, 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 not just the personal feeling of, of me and my sin and my shame, but, but that contempt is you knowing my sin and seeing me for who I truly am. So it's not even unfair contempt. It's like actual contempt because the truth of the matter is if our records are put out there, any of us, the rest of us would be mortified and we wouldn't hang out with each other anymore. And so this shame and contempt is is what is coming for those who, who who are rebellious against God. And in this moment, as I read this prophecy, I cannot help but look forward to the history of the cross. I cannot help but but listen to the divine figure who I believe is Jesus looking forward to his cross where he took the shame and contempt. Where he took the inescapable justice that, that my sin was put upon his back. Not metaphorically, but actually. It says in Colossians, so vividly, it says that you who were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh, that is, outside of the people of God, on your own, outside of the people of God, on my own, outside of the people of God, no right to his benefits, but God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses. Now, how does that happen? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. The legal demands, the inescapable justice of God when we are risen to stand before him in accountability, it will either fall on your back or on Christ's. It's the only way that it can go. And so he took the humiliation for my sin, though he deserves honor. He knew no sin. The spotless lamb. And so if you look at this shame and everlasting contempt and you think it's a terrifying outcome, it is. And Jesus took that for you. He says, you have no need to be afraid if I've taken this on your behalf and therefore at resurrection, you can shine. But you will not shine on your own. And so Daniel, if you've read the book, if you've been here and and heard, he's a faithful exile. He's a solid man of God. Represents the kingdom of God well. He does not bend to the foreign gods. He does not lose heart. He's a faithful exile. But Jesus is the better faithful exile to which this book points. The one who left his home of heaven to come be in a foreign place and to suffer for the people of God. You see, Daniel represented the kingdom of God and he did it well. Jesus ushers in the kingdom of God through his physical presence. And Daniel faced persecution. It was not easy for Daniel at all. But he was delivered. Jesus faced persecution wrongly and was not delivered, was not spared. But took that to the cross And he left his home of heaven, the perfect intimacy with God the Father and the Spirit. And he came to this foreign, broken place to redeem sinful people. And so the takeaway of Daniel, if you read this book and you're like, what do I do with this? Well, one, be encouraged, but it's right here in verse 9 and then in verse 13. Go your way, Daniel. After all that has been said, after all that has been done, Jesus tells him, go your way. 
Go live your life in light of this promise, in light of this prophecy. Don't worry about what you can't change or listen, what you don't understand. But go your way. Go live the specific life that God has called you to. 1 Corinthians 7.17 says, Let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. What that means, going your way, means to live the specific life that God has called you to. You're like, well, how do I know if that's happening? Guess what? God is sovereign. And so if you're like, should I take this job? Should I not take this job? Should I marry this person? Should I not marry this person? Should I move here? Should I move there? Yes, you should pray and seek wise counsel. But guess what? God's will is not dependent upon your decision making. He is a good father, a sovereign king who directs his children in the paths in which they should go. So you have a life and it means something. And it might be very ordinary. I bet you all of us lead pretty ordinary lives. I bet you the history books won't remember any of us. But what God's word says is that that life has been assigned to you by God and it matters. It matters. And so it says, go your way. It does not say go your own way. So if you are a a wordless, you're you're not heeding the word of God, you're not trying to conform to God's will, but you're trying to make maybe God's word conform to yours. I kind of like that part. Or you're, you're, you're prayerless. I was just convicted recently of like, gosh, I feel so prayerless. I feel like I haven't come before the Lord to, to seek his will in certain things. You know what that means? It means I'm arrogant. It means I'm going my own way. And if you're solitary, if you're living life by yourself, just so you know, that's going your own way. Because if you are a part of the people of God, you are a part of the people of God. So don't live your life on your own. But to go your way means to move toward with hope, expectation, and joy toward the immediately uncertain. I don't know what's happening in your life and I don't know what's happening in my life. But it is ultimately certain that there will be deliverance for me and for those who are in Christ. So to go your way means to to walk in that and and to remember what Jesus says later on in the Bible. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I've overcome the world. Satan has been conquered and will be conquered ultimately. And therefore, verse 13, you shall rest. You shall lie down in the green pastures of Christ, brothers and sisters. Your allotted place is not a place of condemnation or of judgment, but of brightness and everlasting joy. Because the shame and the humiliation and the contempt fell upon Christ that you would be rescued and delivered and therefore go your way. Go your way. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and and for the hearty meal of it this morning. Help us to go our way in light of of deliverance, in light of the cross, in light of the reality that, that Jesus, you came that our names could be written in the book of life, sealed by your blood. And therefore we can move into this immediately uncertain, but ultimately beautiful future that you've purchased for us. And and, and we just, 
We just want to express gratitude to you, Jesus. That the the shame and the everlasting contempt that we truly deserve, it fell upon you. And it crushed you. But with your wounds, we are healed. And so we don't deserve that. And the only conclusion that we can come up with is to praise you and to thank you and to rejoice. God, I ask for those who are in this room whose names are not yet written in the book of life, who are going their own way, trusting themselves, that you would call them to yourself. That by your mercy, by your spirit, you would awaken their souls to see Christ this morning. That they would surrender, be saved, and look forward to that glorious future of shining with you. Lord, as we now turn to the communion table, prepare our hearts to receive what you've commanded, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.